Hi, this is Kim White with the My Sexy Business Team. I'm here at the Hope to Hope Conference with the famous Connie Myers with the Crystal Line Moment Success Movement and Publishing. We are having a blast. We had fun with Nation Tribute this morning. She kicked us off. She's a little firecracker, and she got us started on day two of this amazing conference. You know, this conference is all about giving hope to people because we've all been through some things. Uh, and come out the other side. And this conference is for people who need to be encouraged or want to encourage. If you are in a good place, and you know, call me up because we want to hear from you too. But we have a, another powerhouse um, speaker this morning for session number two on day two. Mm -hmm. Demetrius Office. He is um, from in Oklahoma. And he is making waves all over the place. <laughs> Welcome to Meet Studios. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, guys. Thank you for having me on the, on the call, on the video, and, and how, hello to everybody out there. We're certainly glad that you joined us today because um, you just came back from, you just came back from a groundbreaking. You're, you're like, a groundbreaker, I will say that. You're a world changer. <laughs> um, will you give everybody that's listening kind of a rundown of who you are and what you do so that way they can understand um, what we already know is how amazing you are? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, hello, everybody out there. My name is Demetrius Office. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Macarius Developments. And uh, what I am is a, a performance coach and I evaluate human performance by way of people analytics. Um, I got my start, I cut my teeth into this market. Uh, from the military standpoint, I served 13 years on active duty in, in the United States Air Force. And, and uh, God told me to saddle up and, and move on. And he has some instructions for me. And if you know anything about um, when he speaks, sometimes it's great to hear his voice, but sometimes it's, <laughs> you just, you, you better buckle up because he's going to send you on a ride that's going to that's gonna be transformational. <laughs> that's right. And you know, you are, um, I think one of the things I appreciate the most about you is you are this way. Like, all the time. Like, yes. It's not camera that you're full throttle. You're full throttle all the time. <laughs> yes. yes. I've been told that time and time again, Kim. And uh, <laughs> I take that as a compliment because sometimes you have to, um, you have to find a strength within because if you sometimes look around you, Sometimes that strength is not available or accessible to you. And, and if you can't find that strength within and remain on 10, excited about your why and what you're designed to do, then you can kind of get lost in translation. Yes. Well, I want to say thank you for serving because we sometimes take that too lightly of what sacrifice you make to serve. You know, a lot of people see it as just another career, but the truth is you sacrificed a lot to to serve all of us and keep us all free. So thank you for that first. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be so, um, a taker in my life, in my younger years, in my stupid <laughs> dumb years. Uh, and I just <laughs> I just, I've seen people as, you know, what can I get out of you? And and I guess uh, when the uh, terrible attacks of 9-11 happened and, and I saw the magnitude of of that disaster, it really transformed my mind, you know, and I just started thinking about how many people lost their lives and not not just the people that lost their lives, but the family members that lost their family, uh, the uncles that's missing a, a nephew or a niece or a mother that's, you know, that outlived their their um, offspring or sister that just lost their brother or vice versa. And, you know, it just really had a, a major impact in my life. And that's when I decided to come in the Air Force. 
Well, we appreciate you serving, and I, I will tell you, I, I've seen your video where you were deployed not long ago for something, and you were on the helicopter, and we, yeah. we like, we had to feel like we were part of it. I thought that was pretty awesome. Well, that sounds awesome. I'll have to go find that. Yeah, I, um, I recently had an opportunity to, I mean, everybody know the events of Hurricane Harvey, and and when I was on active duty, uh, uh, serving, uh, they tasked me to go down to Afghanistan. And so I did a, a tour down in Afghanistan, which was really amazing. I mean, I was frightened more than I can even explain on this video, but it turned out to be one of the most incredible experiences of my life and gave me vast amounts of different perspectives in life. And, and um, transitioning off of active duty, when I got the call to go and serve at Hurricane Harvey, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure that we clean up our own backyard. You know, I mean, we always fighting wars overseas and, and liberating other countries and people and supporting them. And, and we got a mess in our own backyard. And so I wanted to be able to, to make an impact here in our lands. And, and when I got the call to serve at Hurricane Harvey, as devastating as it was and the stories that, uh, that, I heard and seen and witnessed for myself. It just put it all in perspective for you. Well, you are definitely a server, and I think it's awesome. This is one of the things about hope to hope that that um, we've chosen wisely who has come on because it's people that are willing to be transparent and vulnerable and share something. And you know, being a being a taker, as you say, no one wants to say that about themselves. Like, no one wants to own up to that. But, you know, we all have those places in our life that mm -hmm. we have to assess and do something different. How did, right. you, how did you come to the conclusion that you were a taker and not a giver at that point? Well, you know... Um... In our in everybody's childhood, everybody was a kid at one point, and and kids are brutally honest with you most of the time, and they're gonna tell you, you you're gonna say the sky is blue, and they're gonna say the sky is purple, whatever. It's just the way they perceive life to be, and and in my childhood, I was faced with uh, different experiences. Um, I think there's a a test out called ACES, and that and ACES stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, and what it does is it just records what you experience from the age of birth to 18. And, and I just was fascinated. I just came back from a conference that, that talked about narrowing down that eight, that window from 18, uh, zero to birth to 18 down to zero to five, because the child's brain develops, is, is developed at three years old. So at three, two to three years old, that child is now absorbing all of their surroundings and and are really asking, you know, the, the why question, you know, the question that parents uh, can't get away from. Why, how come, how come, why, why is it like that? And I was one of those kids. And I was always asking how come and why, why is it like that? And how come we're poor? And how come we don't have everything that everybody else has around us? And where's my father at? And, and how come... I see my friends with their fathers and, and mothers and having great times and experiences. And my household wasn't like that. And so at an early age, I knew that I wanted more out of life. I just didn't know the method of how to get it and the, and the best road to, to do it. And, and so I just looked at people as vessels to be able to get wherever I want to get out of them uh, to you know, achieve what we all want in, in life, and that's peace and happiness. And, and so, um, yeah, I was quite the taker, you know, in my, in my younger <laughs> years. And, and, uh, and I thought it was just perfectly fine until I, st I began to pay the price, you know, for, for taking. Uh, and I think that that came in the form of um, exhaustive friendships, relationships, um, all around me wasn't really real, and I knew I needed to make a difference. You know, I, I knew I needed to 
not step on people to actually get to where I wanted to go. So what do you feel that your military services provided you now? What tools are you now using that you received in the military? You know, in that taker mindset, uh, just to segue into with your question, and that taker mindset, um, you know, I came in, uh, I grew up around a lot of military members, retired Army, retired Air Force, and they all had their opinions and they all had their advice. And, and most of the advice that I heard was stay under the radar. You know, if you go in a gun hole, you know, they're going to pick you off, you know, and, and you just, you got to stay under the radar. And so mm -hmm. I took that advice. In fact, the first day of basic training, uh, we had uh, a kid that came with an Air Force backpack and he already tried to cut his hair in that military style. And, and sure enough, as soon as we got off the bus, they are the TIs, the, you know, instructors are right in, down his throat. And, and, and I just, I just went in the background and, and just kind of, so that transition from uh, that advice coming into the military, I just kind of wanted to stay under the radar. And I was a little older when I came into the military than the average candidate. And I just, I've always, you know, kind of seen what was going on and try to stay under the radar to, you know, kind of control my environment. Uh, and, and that's what I learned to do is not necessarily control the environment uh, from my military experience, but to uh, be, uh, you know, just observe everything and learn and be coachable and be teachable and um, the determination behind the perseverance that, that I've learned through the military training. Uh, it was... I didn't think I needed it at the time uh, because I just, I was very um, egocentric, I would say. Uh, God gave me a really gift to playing basketball. And so I was very competitive in that, in that arena. And, and I was heavily sought after by a bunch of college schools, D1 schools and, and whatnot. And, and I always, I always was the one that was, you know, people was chasing me and and wanted what I what I had, and so that bred a lot of ego, a big ego inside of me. And and coming into the military, I realized very quickly that you cannot have an ego in the military. You really can't have an ego in life, um, uh, because I think we all heard that saying is it's just edging God out of the process and. And if you edging them out, then you can't hear further instructions in where, what direction you need. Well, I have to say that you are not either of those things anymore. Like, no. you might still battle them because we all battle our pride and we all battle, you know, the taker mentality. But you are super humble. You are... Um, I still remember like the day that I met you and I was kind of overwhelmed with you a little bit because you were so humble and so kind and yet you were doing all of these amazing things. So, I mean, it, it's kind of, it, it's really refreshing to meet someone who is genuine and not driven by ego because you know that's that's the thing is if you're not driven by gathering up money you're driven by gathering up power and mm -hmm. those two things are not really on your radar yes you make money in business and yes you're a very powerful man but neither one of those things have to be flaunted in your life and i appreciate that about you like to hear that you are a taker kind of tickles me because it's like I actually wasn't expecting you to go there because that's not who you are now. You are so generous and you are so kind. Yeah, Kim, I mean, we, I, I think, you know, a lot of the troubles in the world today, I mean, if you look at our national debt ceiling um, that we are held to, and accountable for 
I think that is directly correlated with broken relationships, broken promises. You know, you said you were going to do this and you didn't do this and, and how dare you this and how dare you that. And, and, um, and it's just all based on relationships, you know, and, and for a good majority of my year, my younger years, you know, that was me is, you know, is that, that friendship that had expectations behind it. And, and I expected you to, to do this and, and you expected me to do this. And nobody ever had, had that, that genuine touch to, um, to what friendships really means. And that's just removing the expectations. And if, if we can get to giving um, without any expectations, I think that's when we'll start seeing a, a healthier culture a more nurturing culture. I think we're, that's when we'll start seeing um, the jobs reports go up and and the innovation go through the roof because it's genuine relationships. And, and you know, with precarious developments, that's what I'm poised to do as a performance coach is to fuse different relationships together. You know, I think for me, it's all about a relationship. It's all about nurturing one another and and supporting one another and if we can get to that i know that's a lot of intangibles and and a lot of people don't believe in that you know and it, it's all oh, it takes too much time to do that sometimes and and i don't have all that time because everybody is so busy nowadays but <laughs> i tell you one thing that i can't do on a regular basis is i can't financially contribute to everything that i want to in my heart uh, but one one thing that i've I've uh, I've made a priority is if someone asks me to actually do something for them, that means that they have um, thought about it, they have spewed over it, they may have went uh, behind closed doors and and beat themselves up and and finally they built up enough courage to actually come out and ask someone, you know, and not and it's not just me or it's it's, it's Kim, it's it's everybody on this call. Um, they they built up enough courage to actually come out and ask, and there's a science behind that ask, uh, a psychological twist behind that ask. And and the way I perceive that today is, when, if you build up that kind of courage to actually do that, then the most precious commodity that I can give is time. And so I think that my time uh, investment in the people. Uh, goes a long ways. Yeah, that's that's like a really um, drastic difference between what you were saying about exhausting people because of the taker part, and then actually building people up because of the giving time. And you know, you may not always be in a situation to give money. And you may not always be in a situation to give, you know, what people are asking specifically, you know, but we do have control of how much time we have and how much time we'll invest in someone. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, honestly, that's one of the things that kind of hurts my heart sometimes whenever I have someone ask for something, um, they'll ask for like they'll ask for money or they'll ask for um, something in particular. And I try to invest in them time-wise and invest in them to empower them because I want them to not have to ask anyone for money. Like that's right. another, and we all go through times. I mean, we we just came through a little thing of, I, I don't even want to like talk about it. We, we went through a, a little bit of a dry spell and it was like what what is going on and we had to do some adjusting mm -hmm. but that investment of you know time into someone and empowering them so that they can do something different the rest of their life i think yeah. that's the key mm -hmm. but you invest in people where they're changed from now on there it's not the it's exactly. the quick hundred dollar fix it's the yeah. You're investing in all of the rest of their life. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that, that is uh, so important that you 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 talk about the, the investment, and uh, I think I think we first have to define uh, investment, and and really come to a, a general consensus of of what that truly means, because um, sometimes it's it, it is uh, coupled with a transaction. And it's not necessarily a transaction, you know, um, and we have this transaction nature about us today that, you know, oh, I'm going to give you something in return that you're going to give me something or mm -hmm. you're going to do something and, and, and you're going to expect me to do something in return, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that breeds contempt and that brings skepticism uh, uh, and into all of our processes is because we, our default systems now in our brain is saying that, okay, you're asking, you're giving this and with the expectations of getting something, mm -hmm. or, you know, you, you ask me to do something with the expectation that you're going to get some kind of benefit on the other end. And that's what is holding us back as a, a, a culture or society or people is just that is you know everybody thinks that you know there's something that you want there's something weighing in the balance that you're not saying and because i don't know what that is i'm a, i'm gonna retract back and i'm a recluse back and i'm i'm a i'm i'm not gonna honor whatever it is that you're you're saying and and that's what society we are today and we just need to transform that and we have to define what is investment today and it's not necessarily coupled with the transaction. If we don't understand what a relationship looks like anymore, I, and I'm talking about in society, you know, yeah. if, if I want to do something for you, that doesn't mean that I have a hidden agenda. Right. And because marketing has sometimes taken a turn of being twisted, and I'm going to bait and switch, I'm going to act like I care about you. And then I'm really just going to sell you something. Right. You know, I'm not really going to. And, and I think that happens so many times that we all kind of become a little cynical. Exactly. In, well, what do you mean you're going to do this thing for me? Right. Well, maybe maybe you have a hidden agenda. You just haven't told me what it is yet. And I'm, right. I'm scared to get in a relationship with you because I don't know what the cost is. Right. And I think that's. A sad, sad thing because yeah. we can be able to have a relationship with each other with not the transaction mindset, no strings, yeah. with no strings, yeah, with just being a blessing. I mean, I think you're incredible because I know you have a business, and you know, I have a business, we've not actually transacted anything, but I feel like we have a relationship, yeah, you know. And, and I think that's more important. I don't care if we ever do business. Yeah. I do care if we yeah, don't I, have so, What you're saying is so, is so important because, you know, one of my, one of the great speakers today is Simon Sinek. And, and um, you know, he authors the book Start With Why. And he also authors the book Why Leaders Eat Last, you know. And, and, uh, and when we're talking about, you know, not, removing that transaction, I think people haven't come into their why, they haven't come into their purpose. Because when you really truly come into your why and your purpose, um, that's when the pendulum swings and that's when uh, all kinds of things come up and you just, you know, you have to get better at it. You know, you, that's a weak part of you and, 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 and that may not be your strongest suit and, and, and whatnot. And you know, you need to develop that area of your life. And and it begs that you develop those things before you achieve those things, you know? And, uh, and that's, that, that's a part of our problem in our culture today is that, that the devil is in the details, you know, the, the, you know, nobody wants to actually go the long road, you know, and, and actually build something that is sustainable. It's, it's just a short run, a short, short term goal, a short sale, a short cycle. I mean, in fact, I had, a guy uh, reached out to me a couple of days ago and, and wanted me 
uh, to take a look at uh, a network marketing deal. And, and I'm pro network marketing. You know, I mean, I, I'm pro building your life. If you can find a platform that you can really ingrain yourself in and, and build your purpose and build your why and shoot for your dreams and shoot for your goals, uh, I'm so for it, you know. Uh, but he approached me and then he, you know, linked me to his upline and, and his upline reached out to me and then his upline set up a meeting and, and I gave them I gave them the time. But going to that meeting, uh, just I just wanted to hear what they were saying. I'm just being compassionate about what, what it is that they are passionate about. And um, the guy that actually <laughs> reached out to me, he wasn't even at the meeting. <laughs> you know, uh, so to me that just was a total transaction. And you know, and and that's what we expect is somebody to come in and sweep it and do it for us instead of us go, actually going through the process. Nurturing those relationships, you know, uh, um, I think uh, was it Jim Rohn or or um, or someone? I think Jim Rohn said, "Give more in value than you ever take in payment." You know, Absolutely. and that actually stuck to me. And and I don't know what we what you and I are going to do in the future. I hope it's something, you know. Yeah. Um, but I just I'm in a position where I just give more in value than I would ever take. And payment for many. And you know, I want to say something about that because you know, you and I are both believers, and I think that God pays better than any man can anyway. And so, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you're giving value everywhere you go, you can't help but be followed with the, the you know, the money. The money follows. The money, the money follows. follows. The money follows. When you're, when you're living the life you're supposed to be living, yeah. the money shows up. Yes. And so I think. And that's key. Yes. And that's key. It will show up, but you have to do the work first. Yes. And Absolutely. people don't want to do the work. You know, they don't want, <laughs> oh, I'm going to get my elbows dirty or oh, my nails are going to get dirty or, you know, it means I got to wear this hat. It's going to mess up my hairdo, you know. <laughs> Whatever, you know, like, oh, my legs are tired. I'm, I don't want to walk anymore, you know, when it, when your blessing is around the corner, you know, just go a little bit more around the corner, but they don't even want to do that. You know, they just want to, to come and sit in a, come to me, come to me. <laughs> you know, that don't work like that. You know, something that's really hard to for me because you and I are wired a lot the same. We just do a lot of things. We get a lot of things done. And it's probably wired that way. It's very hard for me to try to talk someone into doing something <laughs> because I don't understand that. Like, I don't understand. And, and I don't mind explaining a process and I don't mind, you know, going through the trenches with someone. Mm -hmm. But if I have to convince them to be motivated to do something, I'm not your flavor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I have. You know, I have too many things going on that need to be done and accomplished. And getting a grown-up and treating them like a child is not on my radar. No. No. Like, I just don't have it. I've never done that. Yeah. yeah. In fact, <laughs> I, was, I, I was having a conversation with a, with a good friend of mine and, yesterday. And uh, he wants to go in kind of the line of work that I'm in. And, and he wants to build his book of business and... and uh, you know, just attract different clients. And, uh, and I said, let me give you a word of advice. Um, know that if, if you're a very philanthropist, uh, philanthropist uh, and, and you just want to do something for yourself and you want to build something for yourself, um, you got to be careful of how, who you say yes to. You got to be careful of who, what clientele you bring mm -hmm. in because they can just suck the living life out of you if you're not careful. It may be top dollar. It mm -hmm. may be that golden goose, you know, that you've been looking for. But, you know, your sanctity is far more valuable than, you know, the money that you put in your bank account because it comes with a lot of stresses, you know. So you got to be careful of you know, of, of who you, you know, you want to win, you want success, and you know what it looks like, you know what it feels like, you know what it tastes like. Um, you're on, uh, obviously, you're on the journey to achieving it, 
Uh, and sometimes uh, some different opportunities come up that sometimes the price tag, the you know, the, the, the revenue that you generate from it looks sexy. I mean, it looks amazing, but that could cost you if you're yeah. not careful. Yeah. So how did you become a performance card coach? But that's a, a great story. Great, great story. I think great, great question too behind that. Um, just I'm gonna keep it really brief. But I, I'm serving on active duty. I uh, served as the I've served in so many different positions on active duty. But I've always been uh, on the administration side of the house. And and uh, my last job on active duty uh, was a data quality analyst. And in that in that position on active duty, I re I recorded a lot of the metrics the key performance indicators, excuse me, of the company. Um, and, and I reported those numbers up to headquarters Air Force. And, and uh, as I kept reporting those numbers up and I developed really good relationships with, um, with senior staff at, at headquarters, and I always was reporting the numbers, but I always had that question of, you know, is the – the real numbers behind what we are reporting. I mean, how does the people actually feel, you know, about what they're doing? And and the only thing I'm looking at is numbers, you know. And and I just was very curious into the performance side of the house. And so as I report, as I begin to report those numbers up to headquarters, uh, I started asking the question, the questions out in you know in in the organization of how do you feel? What do you feel? I mean, is it is it what what I'm seeing on paper? Is it, am I seeing it digitally? I mean, tell me the real. And and it was such a major disconnect in their performance metrics versus what the numbers said. And that's what we do. We we make decisions based on the numbers instead of actually going to talk to the people today. And so I just I just holy cow, God just. I mean, you, you know how that those car, those clouds that part and that ray of sunshine come out, and you like what? You know, and and that's what happened to me. God said, "Here you go, my son." You know, and I said, "What?" And I just <laughs> fell in love with it, and and uh, and I knew that this was my calling. But before before that, um, that glorious moment, uh, I had a a troop that was assigned to me. Uh, I was just coming back from Afghanistan and this troop, my wife called me and she goes, well, you got your hands full when you come back, you know, and, and cause she knew of this troop. And I was like, oh, I'm not worried about it, you know? And so when I got back from Afghanistan, they assigned me a few, a few people up under me that I was uh, managing. And uh, this particular troop was just coming into fresh, fresh in the military. And um, he had already got in so much trouble. And they goes, here, there you go. You're going to mold them and you're going to shape them. You're going to fix them. <laughs> and uh, so I sat down with the troop and I said, what's going on, buddy? You know, and, and you know, he was very skeptical and very reclusive, you know, in, in, in nature. And because he didn't have a lot of trust and certainty in the process because everybody was out to gun, gun and get him. And so I, I took him under my wing and invite him over for dinner at the house and fed him and spend time with him and, and had those, those key conversations with him. And you can just slowly begin to see a transformation in him. I mean, I mean, the dark clouds parted up from over him and, and some rays of sunshine came in and, and he began to acclimate and blossom. And, and it just turns out that he just needed to feel accepted. It, it just turns out that he needed to feel like he was valued. Um, that he made a difference in that organization and his performance. Go figure. It started rising. Uh, and then I got a call because I won a lot of rewards when I was in Afghanistan to actually go and work as an executive assistant to the wing commander and the command chief. And so I parted his uh, uh, ways with him and, and I wasn't his supervisor any longer and somebody else came in and took over. Well, in that time when it came in and took over, his performance shifted it back to horrible again. Back to horrible. I mean, it was bad. And by the time I got back to the organization, I did two years in that position, almost two years in that position. By the time I got back to that position to see him, they had already packed his bags and 
done all the paperwork to kick him out of the military. He wouldn't fit to wear the uniform and blah, 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 this and that and third. You know, and, and they was done with him. And I had one week with him before he departed out. And, um, and I said, man, what happened? We was on a really good path. What happened? And, and he said a couple of names. And, and I was like, oh, I knew I knew that, you know, but how come you couldn't overcome that? You know, how come you couldn't figure out a way to, to, to find your strength in that? You know, and he said, they, they just never gave me a chance. I mean, I just, they put me in one category and not, there's nothing I could have done to, to transform their thinking. And they never gave me a chance. And I said, and after that week was over, I said, man, stay connected. I love you. Um, We'd be talking to you. Well, that year, uh, right before New Year's, he committed suicide. You know, wow. and and that is what I mean. It flipped it for me. You know, and and so many emotions was developed in that. And and I said, what could we have done to reach him? What could we have done better to take care of him? You know, and and I just hold us responsible so much for not caring for people. And you wouldn't imagine how many people are out there that just want to feel like they are valued. They just want to feel like they belong and they are they have a voice, you know, and, and there, there's a possibility out there. And so that's when God truly gave me the uh <laughs> the instructions and uh i'm so i would tell you i'm so glad that he put blinders on me in this instruction i mean basically i jumped in this thing like i was doing a cannonball in the pool i was like cannonball and i went to splash everybody you know <laughs> and uh and in that process i'm so glad he kept the blinders on me because i've gone through so much turmoil when you when you start focusing on human performance relationships, people analytics, like you are uncovering, unveiling like the abyss. Like people have don't want to talk about it. They don't want to deal. They think they know it and they don't need you to come in. And it's been a struggle uh, up until this point. And finally we're cracking into um, some of the markets. And so persistence has always been the key that's how and that's how I became a performance coach is I knew that not a lot of people is going to genuinely make that change and if I want to see the change I need to be the change and I need to do it I love that and you know he wasn't a number he was a person and I think that's the one of the keys to transforming our our agendas is to remember that when we get in the transaction part, that's the numbers. And when we stay in the relationship part, that's the people. Because it's the people that matter. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you took it as serious as, you know, that, that his life is lost now, you know, he's not here to even do something different now. Mm-hmm. And if we, if we took it that serious, our actions, I think, would change knowing that we do impact people. You know, people people want to just go their own way and stay isolated or they want to do their own thing and just look out for number one, you know, and, and they have that kind of attitude. But we really do impact each other. We really do have an, an effect on how other people make it through life as well. You know, this type of conference, this conference is about that. That's what this is all about. This is our give back because, you know, we've been very blessed and we've gone through a lot of things. But this conference is for that very thing for all those people out there that they know that they are in not the right position or they need to level up or, you know, maybe they're in a good position. But it's still one of those things that if we don't have those relationships in our lives, and we're not giving, and we're not being participatory in life. Yeah. You know, I I just can't imagine. I, I think, and I think you become skeptics with people when you say you're going to give them a gift of 
of whether it's coaching, whether it's your time, whether it's help, this conference, uh, anymore, people are skeptical. Well, why, why aren't you trying to close me? Why aren't you trying to sell me something? And I, I always find it interesting when I, when I talk with somebody and I say, this is my gift to you. Yeah. And they, they don't necessarily buy it. They, they keep thinking they're waiting for me to ask them for something. Mm -hmm. um, and after my husband passed away, I, I did a complete 180 degree turn. When you're talking about those clouds party, I call that crystalline moments, moments of clarity. And I really, I really felt like I needed to change my attitude and how I approach people and how I did things. And so to me, it's all really, it, I think if we could all get to the point where it's about relationships, then the, from those relationships can come incredible gifts and transactions and things that are going to be yeah. meaningful. Yeah. I think, I think, holy cow, I mean, have, have you just hit the nail on the, I mean, just, you, you're spot on. It's just, we don't realize is that, you know, in this taker mentality, you know, when you take, I mean, like psychology, you know, I mean, the psychology behind it, the uh, the behavior that you are nurturing behind that taking, it's just unreal in what it does to you. And and when we take, we just lose a little bit part of us, a little bit of us. We lose a little bit of us. And and we don't realize that, you know, the way to good health, the, the key to good health is it's giving, you know, uh, giving. I, I mean, I ran into a lady uh, at McDonald's, right? Because McDonald's, you can meet some of the greatest characters <laughs> on the face of the planet, right? <laughs> and so she came in, she was talking to herself, and, you know, I, I wasn't too, you know, indifferent about her talking to herself until she started answering herself. <laughs> I said, what is going on here? But... um she started talking to me and she started quoting some scriptures and I was like, and I, and I was pressed for time and I needed to uh, get to the next meeting. And, and God just said, stop, be still, you know? Uh, and so I, you know, I was running late and I said, okay, I'm stopping. I'm going to listen to her. This lady's crazy, but I'm going to listen to her. And she started just spouting out some, some scriptures from Isaiah and, and just, it was just, it was like God was speaking to me. And it, it really was so impactful to me because by the time I got to, showed up late to that meeting, I was apologetic and, and everything. And, and what we were going over in that meeting is, you know, the to-do list, the tasks, the accomplishments, you know. And, and you know, we were just talking about, you know, um, how do you, your schedules and time management and, and how you plan out your day and, and one lady said, well, I, I, I like sticky notes and I write, you know, letters on sticky notes, you know, and and it's something about, you know, you know, once I accomplish that task, you know, I ball that sticky note up and I throw it away in the trash and it's like, heaven, done. And another one said, you know, I, I, I create a to do list and I line it out, you know, and it's like one thing down it's accomplished, you know, and and uh, I just got to thinking to myself about living life in the margins. And I don't really know what the margins meant, you know, living life in the margins. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was sitting there listening to these people talk about how they manage their days, and, and uh, I was quite different because I, don't, I didn't know if I managed my day at all. You know, I just, you know, I just took in whatever God needed me to be at and whatever he needed me to hear, you know. And, and, uh, and then God just spoke about living life in the margins and, and then the, the, the margins is uh, this lady in McDonald's. The margins is knowing that you have a busy schedule and someone you ask someone how they're doing and they say, well, I'm not doing so well. And instead of speeding by and, and, and moving past that, you actually stop, pause and say, well, what's going on? And have a conversation and be genuine at it. You know, those are the marginals that, light that God gives you and he's testing you and he's wanting to see if you're going to, you're going to be a good steward of, of, of that. And what we don't realize is that in those margins is where the greatest gifts come, you know, uh, in those I, margins, if you live in life in those margins, that's where like 
euphoria comes. That's where clarity comes, you know, because he want to see if you're going to take time to invest into what he's trying to show you. Mm-hmm. And we don't take that time to actually stop pause because we're so busy and we got to get from point A to point B and point C. And, and we're just, we're not really living life in the margins, you know? And so that really transformed my thinking of what living life in the margins is. And that's what I encourage people to do is to, you know, I know you got things to do to take care of, and it's probably vitally important, important, but if there's an opportunity there for God to really intervene or something comes up in your day where you have to just stop, pause, and listen, and just be a good steward of, of you know, those marginal efforts, what you find is just blessings beyond blessings. You know, yes. you know, when you live in the margin, like when you live in those places of allowing yourself to be led into those relationships that don't look like what you're looking for. I mean, you weren't looking for that lady at McDonald's. And mm-hmm. you're probably thinking, I would have been, maybe I can be a blessing to her for a minute. And she turned out to be a blessing to you with the scriptures you needed to hear. I mean, yeah. we, we miss a lot of gifts, I think, in the margins because it doesn't look like what we want it to look like. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's not what I asked for. I mean, that's not what I was looking for. But, you know, and that's another thing. You know, you have to be careful what you ask for, too, nowadays because you might just get it. You know, it's like one of the things that... that that is painful. Or that? Can I have you? <laughs> one of the things that one of the things that's painful for me uh, is when people when I hear people say I, I want the best. I, you know, I got to have the best. You know, I got to mm-hmm. I got to wear the Chanel. I got to do this. I got to do that. You know, I got to have the best, and the best is great. But if you don't know how to take care of the best, if you don't know how to nurture the best, if you don't know how to value the best. You know, your best you, you, your best bet is gonna is gonna be ending up where you started at the point point A. You know, because you're not gonna be able to to hold on to the best. Because you're not taking care of the least right now. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, no, you know, no. We just did. Um, we just and then I love your because I always said that to my boys when I was raising them. You know, be careful what you ask for; you might get it. And that is something that I know I was supposed to ask for it, but I always get like tickled up myself because I have to be reminded when I ask for clarity. Clarity brings chaos. It oh. does not bring. It does not bring this little peaceful, you know. Little, well, it does, <laughs> but you gotta go through the chaos. But you gotta go through the process of getting all the things that are not right in your life changed. Yeah that you can walk in that clarity and we we just went through some things that were in my opinion my princess opinion were major changes because I asked for clarity in some things and we have been laughing Miss Connie and I have been like laughing about the fact that when I asked for clarity it looked like the whole world turned upside down But knowing the process, I know on the other side of the upside down world, <laughs> it all will be well again. It, it is going to come with what I asked for, and that's that's part of that living in the margins. Is I don't want to live a life that's okay. I want to be a good steward of those relationships in my life, and I want to be a good steward of the blessings that God has given me, and I want to be a good steward of the gifts that he's put inside of me to to give. Yeah. I, I want to be a good steward of that. And sometimes that means we've got to take away the junk. You know, we've got to cut away things out of our life that we're familiar with and we don't really want to cut it away. Yeah. And I think that of you, when I think about you, Demetrius, I think you have a lot of clarity and I, I have, you know, seeing you go through some things and get more clarity, and you're changing not just your life, 
you're changing the people around you, but you're also changing your whole community. I mean, your yeah. entire community is being affected by the clarity that you've gotten in your life. Mm, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I you know, I, you know, Abraham Maslow, uh, hierarchy of needs, you know, it talks about self-actualization and, and um, if you never have any self-actualization, if you don't really know what your purpose is, what you are designed to do, you know, in the Word of God it says we were created, we are His handiwork, we created to do good things which He has prepared, prepared for us in advance to do. You know, and, and we just not stepping up to the plate today because we're afraid, you know, because of our childhood experiences or somebody told us no or, you know, you wanted to date that girl or you wanted to date that guy and you built your confidence and they shot you down and blah, blah, blah. And we just we just built these barricades around us and we just we just restricting ourselves from actually becoming what we are intended to become and breaking down those barriers, what we are intended to become to break down and I think you know part of my drive today is I don't really care about what you think <laughs> I don't really care about what they think I don't really care about what they're saying they're going to talk regardless you know uh, you know I think uh, it was Harold Ford that says be so good that they can't ignore you you know and and, and so I just, I just I just have that mentality in my life you know I, I, I'm a chairman of the Salvation Army board here and um I'm very high speed, and I already told my board that I'm a poke, I'm a poke you, I'm a pry at you, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a disturb your comfortable nature, and and it's because we have poverty in our city. It's because we have children that that's probably gonna, not going to have a Christmas, you know, in our city, in the city that you live in, in the city that you you reside in, and you take care of, you know. And as long as we have those things here, then I think we got a lot of work to do. And so don't. Don't be so passive when I come to you and I say, get your crap together because it's time to go, you know. And they thought I was playing, Kim, I'll tell you, they thought I was playing. <laughs> you ask them today <laughs> and it's made a difference, you know, because, you know, and it, it, it all gets back to that self-actualization. When you are clear on who you are and your purpose and your why, right, you know, you you all. I'm, I'm never going to tell you that it's going to get easier. Um, it's going to be attainable, though. It's going to be attainable. In fact, it's probably going to get harder because the more you push towards your why, the more resistance it comes because you're you're cutting into a uh, an environment, an unknown environment that you just don't have any that most people don't want to even venture off into. You know, yeah. and. And and you're gonna have to break down some barriers. But if you know, if you're clear on what you are designed to do, then that's where uh, that change begins to ignite on the inside of you. And it, and it only can start on the inside of you. You can't you can't go poach you know the variables outside of you and say change me. You can only you know be at one with your, yourself and change yourself inside. And then once you be the change that you see inside, and that's when everything starts to transform around you, you know, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's attrition. You're going to experience some attrition in it. You know, there's going to be some ebbs and flows, some highs and lows, uh, but you're going to weed out the people that don't really belong there just by attrition, but just by sheer attrition. And I think that's what's happening in, in the great city of Enid is that, you know, those people that are, you know, that, that's not really diverse in their thinking, that 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 likes those you know what i call a car a, a cartel they create these cartels like you don't do this and i don't do this you don't sell this i don't sell that you stay within your confines i'll stay within my confines you know and you just can't be that way in this world today you have to diversify your thinking you have to diversify you know your processes and you have to be open and honest and tra radically transparent is what i call it you know, and or else you're going to fall behind in your little your little circle, your little island, your little Truman show that you created, you know, over the years. It's going to suffer because, you know, you didn't you didn't get take advantage of the times. So I think, you know, that's what's happening in, in today. <laughs> well, we are running out of time. But do you have a final word? Do you want to give um, a tip of how to how to change from being a taker to a giver and create 
you know, create that legacy that you're leaving where, you know, you came from one place and you're in a totally different place. You yeah. don't want to give it up how someone that finds themselves, they're looking at themselves, doing a self-evaluation and saying, okay, this is not what I was meant to do. This is not where I should be. How can they make a step towards what you're talking about? Okay, good. Good question, Kim. Well, you know, whoever's listening to this out there, uh, what time did you listen to it? I, I want to tell you that you're right where you need to be at. First of all, there's some internal forces and there's some external forces that you might be battling with. Internally, I'm going to deal with internal forces right now. And that's going back to self-actualization. Right now, I'm studying a lot of the the, the brain chemistry, the, the, the psychological nature of why we do what we do. And what I found in, in, in science, and science would suggest that there's a, there's a ventral tegmented, tegmented area in your brain. And in that ventral tegmented area is the, whole, uh, is the home of the hippocampus and the amygdala. Amygdala records the fear component. Uh, it, it, it warns you of what's, what, what the fear is mm -hmm. that you may have experienced in your past. And then the hippocampus records the environment to, to which that fear happened. And so if you want to if you want to become a better person, you have to trace back what it is that has has radically transformed your life from when you was two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up until current day, you know, in order to actually see exactly where you shifted two degrees to the right or two degrees to the left off that path. And you have to look at it and you have to generate new neurons in your brain and remove those barriers in your brain and deal with those things that has caused you so much attrition in your own personal life in order to be able to, to be okay with what, what it is, what you are today, you know, and that's the part of that self-actualization. Because if you don't, you know, understand what the ventral tegmented area and the amygdala and the hippocampus function is, those functions, those neurons is firing uh, messages to your prefrontal cortex in the front of your brain, and that's your planning mechanism. And if it's firing those functions off into your, your prefrontal cortex of your planning mechanisms, it's going to keep you comfortable. It's going to keep you safe. It's going to keep you in that environment to where you just are familiar. And if you ever heard the term familiarity breeds contempt, you know, that's where you are in your life. And if you want something different, you have to go back and you have to solve those puzzles, you know, in your life. And you have to be okay with it and you have to deal with it. And then that's where that self-actualization comes from. And when you have that self-actualization, then that's when you can start beginning to actually put some goals in line. And that's when you go externally, you know, uh, put those goals in line, put those methods, those, those methods in place, and then just start jumping out there and doing it. It may be painful. You may get cuts and bruises, but the problem is, now you're in a really good place in your body, in your walk, that you have, um, you know, some, some neosporin to put on that cut before you put the bandage on, right? And when you put the neosporin on and you put the bandage on, when you take that bandage off, it's not going to be a scar left, right? So if you don't do those, if you don't take those steps, if you don't go back and revisit those things that's caused you so much problems in your own past, then you're going to continuously you know, run dead smack in the wall and f try to figure out why you don't do it. And I got lost. <laughs> well, we put, the, we put your website up on the, on the, in the comments so that way we could um, share. If anybody wants to get connected um, to Demetrius, the website's on there. Contacting, contacting through Facebook, and I'm telling you, it is amazing what this man knows and the things that he does. I think we must have lost the connection. Um, but Demetrius, if you can hear us, thank you so much for sharing and being transparent. And you are radically transparent, and I love that term. That's a we, great term. We thank you for being a part of the Hope to Hope conference. Um, we will be back. At noon <laughs> Central Time, 10 Eastern, no, no. Pacific, and 1 Eastern um, for the next one with Rich Hopkins, the next session. 
So thank you guys for attending. I'm Kim White with the My Sexy Business team. I'm Connie Myers with Crystal White Moment Success Movement and Publishing. And we were with Demetrius Office. Thank you, Demetrius. We love you. Yeah, it was fantastic.